G'day everyone and welcome to episode 29 of the Pressure Point podcast. I'm uh, joined as always with my co-host Quinn DeLuca. How you going mate? Very good mate, very good. Uh, we're getting uh, pretty close to being out of lockdown I reckon but it looks of all the numbers and stuff so I'm getting pretty excited especially leading into finals. Might be able to go to a pub. That's a it. Games. Exactly right mate. It's, uh, it is, it's, it's getting a lot better in Melbourne which is great. It's exciting times. Um, but more exciting is the episode that we've got today. We've got former St Kilda player, Robert Eddy. How you going, mate? Yeah, good. Thanks, Marcus. Going well. Enjoying nice, sunny Queensland. I feel for you boys stuck in lockdown there in Victoria, but I was there. I was part of it, so. That's yeah, him. I was gonna, yeah, I was going to say, you're up in sunny Queensland at the moment, uh, living a, a much different life to all of us, that's for sure, aren't you? Yeah, I decided uh, I had a work, couple of work opportunities up here throughout the middle of the year. And when we went into the second lockdown, uh, I decided to pull the pin and did the two weeks quarantine up here and um, currently found myself in Noosa at the moment. So I can't complain too much. I was just down the beach this morning and there was about 600 people because it's like school holidays up here. So okay, yeah, can't complain too much. Sorry to rub it in. <laughs> Unreal. Can, can, can you explain to some of us Victorians that might have forgotten what's the inside of a pub look like? Yeah, it's actually really quite nice. In uh, I've only been to a couple, <laughs> but um, yeah, I, I strange because like we were saying earlier, it's um for those who forget, it's almost like uh, Queenslanders don't I don't think understand how how hard it is in Victoria and especially being locked down. But yeah, definitely. Um, you start, you'll appreciate when the pubs open up again, you're allowed to go back out to your mates and have a couple of beers and watch a footy and probably maybe sneak a couple of games in depending on when Dan Andrews lets us out, but or lets us out everyone. But uh, yeah, definitely. You definitely appreciate those times that you get with your mates for sure. Yeah, absolutely, mate. Spot on. But uh, let's get stuck into the footy. We'll um, talk about you now, and uh, we'll go back to, right to, right to the start to your to your junior footy days. And um, yeah, give us your first memories of playing footy growing up, and um, yeah, and how much you enjoyed your junior footy. Yeah, growing up, I uh, I didn't play a whole lot of footy. I did Oz kick and uh, those sorts of things when I was up until like all through primary school, but I never played actual footy till year eight. Um, I was into athletics and golf and um, that sort of took up my weekends and stuff. And then it got to about year eight. And I remember, oh, well, year seven, I played uh, grade six and year seven, I played netball, follow the footy with my sisters. <laughs> and uh, it wasn't until year eight, I started getting picked on a little bit, just saying I was soft and why, why am I playing netball and not footy? And so I kind of got peer pressured into playing footy. Um, I was a bit of a man child too back then. So it was all right. Like I could kind of, I played in the ruck and center half back if we're in trouble and center half forward if we got right. So that was probably my entry to, to footy when I was in about year eight. Um, and I played juniors with Stony Creek Footy Club and a uh, great club. And um, yeah, I played played uh, under 15s there, played some under 18 games and a few senior games towards the end of school. But um, yeah, that's where it all started. Yeah, perfect. Um, Who did you, who'd you support as a kid and uh, who were you, or did you have any footy idols growing up that you that you sort of looked up to and that you wanted to, to play like? Yeah, I did. I went for Geelong growing up as a kid. Um, my dad went for Geelong, so just as I was uh, growing up, we we used to get down to Waverley Park because I grew up in Gippsland um, in Stony Creek and Waverley Park was probably a little bit closer. So we used to go down to to Waverley Park a few times a year and Gary Ablett Senior was by far my, my idol growing up. Um, I don't know if you boys got to see much of him play, but he was he was different to his son, Gary. He uh, he was just could do some miraculous things, and yeah, he was uh, definitely my idol growing up. I was trying to replicate him out in the backyard a lot, and 
didn't get anywhere near him. <laughs> but, um, yeah, no, he was definitely, it was, yeah, Geelong as I was growing up. And then probably as I was getting closer to getting uh, drafted, it was more just love watching good players and good teams. Um, a bit like everyone else, but yeah, Geelong was my team growing up. Speaking of some good players and good teams, I've tried to do a little bit of research for this interview, so I know what I'm talking about. Now, is it true that uh, it goes under the radar a little bit, but is it true you played um, in the same premiership Gippsland power side with Pendles and Daisy back in 05? Is that true? Yeah, and, what was that, and what was that team like? How, how good were you guys? Yeah, that was that was interesting. I was uh, so at Gippsland Power. I played, I played a few games in the under eighteen TAC Cup when I was in under sixteens, so a bottom bottom age, um, as well as Xavier Ellis, who used to who played with Hawthorne and West Coast, um, and another kid, Ricky Delphine, who went on to play a lot of good uh, local footy in Gippsland as well. So we sort of got introduced into under-18 Tech Cup uh, when when I was about 16. And that year, we made the prelim final. And we had, like, Jared Ruffhead got drafted that year as a bottom age. He was a year above me. Um, and then the next year, I actually went down to Caulfield Grammar as a boarder. Um, and so did Z Xavier Ellis went to uh, Melbourne Grammar. So... We had to, our first commitment was to play for the school. And so once the sort of school season finished, we'd played a few games during the year in the under 18s for um, Gippsland, just on the school holidays. And then we were a pretty good side that year. We had, yeah, a lot of players that got drafted, like Tyson Goldsack was an under 19 that year. Um, uh, we also had uh, Lockie Hansen. Um, yeah, Ben Ross, who got drafted as well. Brent McCaffer. There's a lot of good players that played in that, that team. So uh, it was a bit strange because towards the end of the year, it was coming into finals and we hadn't played a whole lot of games, but we were travelling down on the weekends, or sorry, during the week to go to training. And as finals came around, we ended up, so Zave and myself used to catch the train down from Melbourne. And... Um, Kind of felt a little bit bad that we might have been putting people out of the spot, but that side was, yeah, it was a really strong side. And um, we were coached by Paul Hudson, who coached us the next year as well. And um, so it was, yeah, Andrew Dunkley was the assistant coach from Sydney. Um, we had a really good squad and a really good group. And we were coached really well that year as well. So it was good just to be a part of that team. And, yeah, we got to play the curtain raiser to the West Coast Sydney game. So that was pretty cool on grand final day. Yeah, well, well, well speaking of uh, playing with good players, um, and I'm sure every every Saints fan would love to hear this, but what was it like playing with players like Nick Riott and, and Lenny Hayes? Yeah, it was, it was pretty surreal, to be honest. I know when I first got drafted to the club, I was a rookie and... Um, being uh, like I went to Caulfield Grammar with Andrew McWalter and Brendan, Brendan Goddard used to come down. I wasn't at school when he was there, but he used to come down and kick the footy. So I knew BJ before I was at Saints. And um, that was kind of nice to get down there and have uh, someone that you actually know and make you feel a bit more comfortable. Um, so those two boys were really good. And it, I just remember walking in the door, it was 2000, late 2006, and uh, they had still had like Fraser Garrick, Aaron Hamill, Robert Harvey. There were so many good players, Andrew Thompson. and Yeah, it was just... St Kilda were kind of like my second favourite team just because they were so good. And, you know, players like Nick Del Sano and uh, Justin Kaczynski, Liam Montana, like they were just... It was a really, really good group. And I kind of thought, how the hell am I ever going to get a game in this team, you know? So, um, yeah, I, I think the first first real sort of... Uh, my first training session was just... I wasn't allowed to actually go out onto the track because I hadn't done a medical. And it was just... Yeah, I ended up doing an off-leg session with uh, the older boys like Aaron Hamill and um, Fraser Garrick and a 
Maxi Hudson was another one that they all took that. And it was honestly the hardest thing I'd ever done. I thought, I don't know if I want to do this anymore. <laughs> and, um, but yeah, one of the coaches who was there, he's still there at the moment, Danny Sexton, he was the development coach. And he said, if you ever want to play uh, AFL, you have to be a harder worker than everyone. You have to outwork everyone. So that was kind of my mindset from the first time I got in to the club. Um, and I was thinking, how the hell am I going to outrun Rui? You know, like, <laughs> he's a freak. And, um, but yeah, I sort of, I, I modelled my game off um, Robert Harvey a lot. Like, his gut running and effort. And yeah, it was it was amazing to have those guys as leaders around the club. And that sort of, uh, when we had a bit of success in 09 and 10, we didn't win one. But it was off the back of a lot of those leaders. And, um, you know, the the good training habits that they put in place. So, You modelled your game off some pretty or well, courageous players, as you just said. And I think one thing yeah. that's pretty courageous that I heard, is it, is it true you played both grand finals in, a, in uh, 2010 with a broken jaw and then you fractured your arm in midway through the second one and played out the rest of the game? Is that true? And how'd you put up with the pain if it is? <laughs> yeah, that's true. I, um, I had... I had a few injuries that year, like in the pre-season, I had a hip arthroscope and a knee, uh, sorry, a, a screw put through my ankle. And um, so I was out for most of that pre-season, but then I had a knee operation through about, after about round 10 or 12. And uh, I came back into, got back into the side and in round, I think it was round 20, we might've played uh, Kangaroos. And Brent Harvey stood on my hand and I got a, I got like snapped my hand in half. So I had to, had to get a plate put in my hand and I was out for two or three games. And then Rossi picked me to come back in for the first final against Geelong. And um, so I had to wear this stupid glove and like had to have a guard over it. <laughs> and I said, where do I get a, like a, do they make footy gloves? You know, like I didn't even know. And, so they said, no, I'll just go down to Bunnings and get one and cut the fingers off. <laughs> so I went down to Bunnings and bought this big glove that was like way too big for my hand, but had to fit the guard underneath. So that was for the first final. And then the year before in 09, I got dropped for the prelim. So when we got into the prelim in 2010, I kind of thought, well, I don't want to make the same mistake of, you know, not being hard enough. And I got on, got on the ground at about the 10 minute mark. And I thought, oh, you know, I'm just gonna bump into someone as hard as I can. So the first player I see, you know, and it was Daniel Cross. He was not even that big, he was a good runner. He's not that not that up, big upper body. But um, just as I went to bump him, he turned and he flushed me with his shoulder right on my jaw. And I thought I actually just broke my tooth because my tooth popped out. I thought, fuck, like, so I bit, put it back in and bit down on it for the rest of the game. And halfway through the third quarter, the the dentist come down and had a look at it. And he's like, oh, no, you've broken your jaw straight in half. It's like all loose. So I had an operation the next day uh, and they put like a titanium plate like to and took the tooth out. So I didn't have the best preparation for that grand final, really. <laughs> Um, and then, yeah, we played the, the draw, the fa famous draw, and I didn't play very well that game either, but Rossi gave me another chance to play the next week, and, um, yeah, that was when I played on Nick Maxwell in the first final, and he kept rolling off on me. He was playing half back, and I was playing half forward. So, Ross just said, as soon as you get on the ground, I just want you to get into him and, like, just be a pest to him. So... I did, and he was like, what are you doing, mate? <laughs> I, kept, I kept hitting him in the arm and pinching him. He's like, what are you doing? Piss off. <laughs> anyway, halfway through the, no, it was probably the 25 minute mark of the first quarter. We lot, like I was chasing Harry O'Brien out of the back 50 and me and Nick locked eyes from about 25 meters away. And I thought, we're not coming back a third week. I'm just gonna knock him out. So I just jumped off the ground, went like that. But 
I've missed him and like you can see the scar there now. I've still got the plate in there. Just got him flush with that. But um yeah, we, we actually had uh we actually had a couple of players get injured early in that game and so I kinda had to keep playing. <laughs> Just had to jab it full local anesthetic and put a splint on it and back out there. Yeah, that is uh, that is incredible. Um, yeah. but, but that I'll, leads me on to the next one. Like, what, run us through that experience of playing in, in a in an AFL grand final. I mean, like the build up to it, uh, the parade, the crowd noise, and and obviously you know playing in a draw as well. Just just run us through that all the emotion that sort of goes into um to a grand final week and, and obviously grand final day. Yeah, well, it's obviously a it's a bit of a different week. Um, because you have a lot of things on is that, that you don't normally have, like, for example, leading into a, leading into a normal, like a home and away game is actually, it's kind of a little bit different again, because finals goes up another notch of intensity. So I guess um, you have that to, to deal with. And then you also have, you know, getting tickets for your family, a lot more people contact you that week people that you might have spoken to all year. And so you, you want to do the right thing and talk to everyone. And, but you also got to try and stay focused. Um, and I guess from my point of view, I can only really speak from my point of view, but uh, not knowing if you're going to get picked, like being on the edge, that's another sort of thing that you have to deal with throughout the week. So you try and keep it simple and just focus on what you can control and focus on training and, training well um the thursday uh of grand final week is really big because you have maybe ten thousand people come down to training um so it's a really good atmosphere and it's a really good vibe and then that's followed by the grand final parade the next day um which is uh it's yeah it's really it's amazing grand final parade you know you've got 200,000 people or whatever throughout the city and you know you're sitting up there like a celebrity in the you know back of a Hilux and um yeah that's you got to kind of take in all the energy but not let it sap you as well um so to be honest you, you probably I felt a little bit tired after the grand final parade and you just try and relax and take it easy and you try and keep it as normal as possible but you know, deep down, it's it's um, it's not as normal. And I think, I think, uh, yeah, you sort of come ready just to basically die that day. You know, you're ready to just give everything and and leave it all out there. So it was obviously an interesting result when it was a draw, and uh, that realization set the scene that you've got to come back. I think it's more just you don't want to have to go through training again for another week. <laughs> Yeah, oh, I can imagine the training. It's uh, it's probably pretty intense. I'd imagine leading up to a grand final, you'd want to be you want to have your skills all pretty sharp. Um, but like you said, you you did play in the draw and then you, you got picked again and played in the replay. Um, yeah. And then for a lot of Saints fans, and I'm, I'll probably presume for yourself as well, it's no secret that um, not long after the the grand final, the club probably didn't handle um, your delisting as fantastically as they probably could have. Um, what are your thoughts on how that was all handled? And were you aware that um, after the initial delisting that we're going to bring you back as a rookie? Yeah, it's a good question. I guess, I mean, grand final week, there's always people with injuries and not sure. And I guess being on the edge, it's sort of, you just got to play the ball as it comes, I guess. Um, so, I mean, being in the, picked in the, in the grand final side, those two grand finals, you, you kind of feel like I was out of contract at the end of, oh, I only ever got one year contracts, but um, I was out of contract and I, we had a trip booked overseas and, and uh, well, we did have a footy trip booked that year, which a few, a few went their different way, but um, yeah, I was over in the U S when I found out, um, that I wasn't going to get another contract. And I guess it was a bit of shock at the start. Um, and one second. 
yeah, it was a bit of shock at the start. Um, and I kind of thought, well, and I was a little bit frustrated and, and angry at the situation, but that was just my emotions and that's just how I felt. But when I got back to Australia, I started training again really hard and, and um, Ross said I could still come down and train and do the preseason with the, with the boys. Um, but yeah, it was more so they were only offering a rookie spot to go back on the rookie list. And look, I understood the reasoning behind it. It was, and, and that's just the way footy goes. And that's, it was around, we, through those, through those years of maybe 2009, 2010, we didn't really give some of the younger boys many games. Um, and I guess Rossi was big on making you earn your games rather than just giving games um, to young kids. But I think there was a bit of pressure from maybe the club that, you know, they've invested in these younger players and, you know, that they wanted to see if they could play at that level. So, uh, yeah, there, look, when I got back, there was a there was an opportunity to possibly go to GWS. They weren't in the competition yet, but um, I really thought about going there and that didn't work out on rookie day. So I ended up staying with St Kilda um, back on the rookie list. And yeah, I was, I was really determined to sort of prove that I could go to the next level, but I had a couple more injuries that next year and it didn't help. Um, and then, yeah, sort of, we ended up going separate ways in the end. Yeah, right. Well, I mean, yeah, it's, it must, like I said, um, I guess when you get picked for both grand finals, you'd probably presume you're in the club's, well, at least best 25, um, to say the least. So it must have been a little bit of a shock. But do you think the um, for the club itself, I mean, the, uh, the 09 and 2010 grand final losses, I mean, you guys still had a talented list after those. But do you think those two losses, I mean, especially after a draw as well, do you think it killed the team mentally a little bit going forward? Yeah, it definitely has an impact. Um, you know, getting so close to the Holy Grail and and then having to front up and do it all again, you know, day one of preseason is definitely, it's definitely takes a toll. And I think probably 09, I mean, I got dropped for that, that, uh, that grand final as well. I was in the, played in the prelim, but then got dropped. But so there was, but, I think mentally it, it definitely takes a toll on you um, and the group. And I think every other team is always improving as well every year. So, you know, it's, I guess we, we got to our, probably our peak in maybe 09 and 10. And then, you know, the likes of Collingwood and Geelong and Hawthorne and all those teams started rebuilding and coming back up at us again. So I definitely think that, uh, and look, we also moved from Moorabbin down to Seaford. And I think that our off-field um, camaraderie was maybe uh, inhibited a bit there because we couldn't go out for as many lunches and dinners and stuff during the day or, you know, even just catching up as a little group here and there like we could when we were at, uh, at Moorabbin. And I know it's probably something small like that, but that's where you get the trust on the field is having the trust off the field and, and that, you know, trust that builds over time of, of hanging out with each other. So I think, um, I think that edge maybe just is what was the difference and, and why we sort of dropped away in 2011 and, and then so on. I think this is, yeah, maybe the first time they've made finals since then. Yeah. Um, yeah, you spoke... Yeah. Um, well, you, you spoke about your mates at the club. Who were your, your best mates at the Saints? And do you still keep in touch with a lot of the boys from, from those days? Yeah, I do. Uh, we were a really, really close group through, you know, whenever you have success as a team, I, I think I think that you, you are, even though we didn't win the grand final, I think that you definitely have those bonds and connections for life. And... Um, you know, back in 09 and 10, I remember like Nick Rewalt would say before we go out, he'd almost say, he'd look around and 
and there wasn't one person that we didn't like, which is really strange in a footy team because there's always some that you don't hang out with. But we could literally hang out one-on-one with every single player in that team. And that was what gave us that extra bit of trust and, um, and sort of camaraderie out on the field. Um, I sort of, like one of my best mates is Zach Dawson. Um, I keep in touch with him regularly. David Armitage, Jack Stephen, Jaron Geary. They were a lot of the boys that were my age. And yeah, I still keep in touch with like Lee Montagna, Nick Del Sano, Rui, um, a few other boys, Snides, Jimmy Gwilt, Gilbo. Like it's, yeah, we're all pretty close and I still sort of keep in touch with the boys where I can. Yeah. That's awesome. It's good to see that you guys are... Yeah. I, I was going to say, it's good to see you guys are still keep in contact. Well, that's pretty easy, I guess, especially, you know, it's been, what is it, nearly 10 years now since, I guess, those grand final days. So it's pretty good that you guys have kept all close. Um, but what was, what was Ross like? What was Ross Lyon like um, amongst the playing group? Was he... Uh, from the outside, it certainly seemed like he had a few favourites with players. Um, I know famously... Your mate Zach Dawson was known to be pretty close to him. Did he did he have favourites, um, or was it pretty much mutual love all around? Yeah, I think like any coach, you probably got your favourites. I know. I think because Zach went to Fremantle at the same time Ross went there, and then obviously he got Zach across from Hawthorne. Zach probably seemed like a bit of a love child to Rossi, but there was a funny comment made. I think this year when they did an interview. Ross goes, I could have taken Del Sano, Montagna, Rewald, Goddard. Do you honestly think I would take you, Zach, like to Fremantle? Like, <laughs> you know, I think Zach had maybe already made a decision that he was going to go there before Ross. Um, there was, I heard there was contract negotiations before that. But, um, yeah, look, I think from the outside, it's – it's a lot different to what you experience on the inside with Ross. He, um, he's very, he's very hard on some players, but he, he also knows who he can be hard on and who he's got to maybe be a little bit more caring or compassionate and, and comforting. Um, which is, you know, I think Rossi as well, when he first got to St Kilda was only, he was brand new in a, in a coaching role. So he was learning as well, but, I don't think I've ever seen a coach who's prepared to put in the work as much as he was. And that's the reason why he could demand so much out of his players because he was actually always first at training. He was, he'd review the game for six to nine hours after it. Um, there's a, there's a story about Rossi one, one game, he just couldn't sleep after it and decided to go down to the club to start reviewing the game. But they had the, the the gates were shut, so Rossi just jumped the gates and ended up getting in and unlocked the the doors and got in. And he was doing a review from three a.m. or something. So, yeah, I think that he was he was a footy nut. He he loved he loved the game and he loved getting better. And I think that uh, as hard as he was in some situations, and yeah, maybe he might look back and say, oh, he was maybe a bit too hard, but I don't think so because he actually demanded and got results out of players and he always made you better. Um, so that was my personal experience. I know um, some people say, you know, that it was his fault that, that I got delisted. But then again, he, he chose me and, and picked me in a, you know, and in a team that was really, really good and he put his trust in me and I was actually the youngest player in those group, in that group. So I didn't feel, um, I feel like Rossi, he will, uh, yeah, he, he was, he was very loyal and very good. He, yeah, he, yeah. He had his favorites. He loved the, the older boys. I think it was a bit of a joke going around that he loved Lenny so much, but, um, it, that Lenny was probably his golden child. Um, but, uh, I mean, Lenny didn't do much wrong either, so... Who, who didn't love Lenny, honestly? <laughs> yeah. Yeah, Lenny was amazing. He was on and off the field as well. He was he was such a strong leader and, um, you know, he was, he was amazing on the field. Like, he would do some things on the field that you... 
you wouldn't realise as a spectator of how big and important moments they were in games. You'd lay a massive tackle when just you felt like you needed something else out there on the ground. So, yeah, it was definitely um, probably not a bad favourite to pick, Rossi. Uh, yeah, well, with Rossi, he's obviously uh, he's known for his quirkiness. And um, is there any uh, any spray or, or anything from Ross that sort of lives in the memory and stands out, or, or you know, yeah, something that you'd you'd tell when you all catch up as a group, and um, yeah, something famous that Ross has has delivered to the group or or to yourself. Yeah, I actually, if you ever speak to Nick Del Sano, he's the he's the best person to ask. He, he used to impersonate Rossi. There was one time, so we used to have like uh, before a meeting, we'd get in there, and Rossi used to have a thing that if you like, let's say the meeting was at nine o'clock, and if you got there at nine and one second, like the door would shut and you're not allowed in, and you have to follow up with like your line coach to find out what happened in the meeting. So we used to get there super early, you know, it was like, if you're not 10 minutes early, you're late. So we used to get in there just because no one wanted to be late and the coaches wouldn't be in there. So we'd get on the laptop and we'd put up funny stuff on YouTube and that. And I remember, I think it was Dal must've got up the front and like was impersonating Rossi, like, you know, like this or something. I can't remember. He's doing his famous little walk and, we were all laughing and, and Rossi walked in and Dal just kept going. He didn't know that Rossi had walked into the room. But, um, yeah, I mean, oh, how long have you got if you want to go on sprays? Like, he, he would have sprayed me every game probably. Um, but um, there's one, oh, maybe the one from the grand final is, is, is pretty funny. Uh, so... When I broke my arm, I had to go back down the grant, back down to the race at quarter time, and I had like a local anaesthetic, and we put like the kettle on, and grand final day, put the kettle on, and had to like pour the hot water into the basin, and and get this you know uh, plastic guard for my arm. So I was just thinking, can we hurry up and get back out there, you know? So we quickly did it, wrapped it up. It was uh, the, one of the physios and, and the club doctor. And I got back up to the, to the ground and um, Rossi goes, they go, yeah, Rossi's on the phone for you. So I grabbed the phone and he goes, can you catch? And I said, yeah, I think so. And he goes, well, can you tackle? And I said, I think so. And he goes, well, can you fucking run? <laughs> and I go, yeah, I can run. And he goes, Get back down the race and tell me if you can fucking catch or tackle. <laughs> and just hangs the phone. <laughs> and everyone's going, what did he say? What did he say? And I said, oh, I've got to get back down the race and see if I can catch and tackle. So we went back down to the car park and I had footies getting thrown to me from the from the doctor. And then I'd throw one to the doctor and he'd run at me. And I, yeah, it was, it was pretty full on. But I copped a few other sprays, you know, for not not tackling mainly it was not tackling so yeah pretty funny I was, oh, like like you just said you were clearly on the end of a few ross lyon sprays but famously ross lyon did find himself on the end of a spray from yourself on uh, on twitter a few years back was that uh was that um was, was that, yeah i was waiting to bring that one up was that was that just all a bit of uh fun and games and have you spoken to ross since then because it famously blew up a little bit um after that that's the media for you. Yeah. <laughs> um, we, get, we get the truth here on Pressure Point. We're no fake news here. So we're, <laughs> we're asking this all. <laughs> yeah, I'll tell you the truth what happened. So it was actually, it was, I think they might have been seven and zip at Frio. And I was talking to, so I'm good mates with Dorse, obviously, and Michael Barlow from, from Frio. He's a good mate. And Rossi dropped Dorse and Mickey Barlow. And I think Mick might have had 40 in the waffle that week before. And he was just sort of playing some younger players. And I was on the phone to Zach Dawson. And and I said, oh, if, if he doesn't play you and Mick this week, and he didn't, 
and then I said, if he, if he doesn't and, and you guys lose, I'm going to write something on Twitter. And I didn't really understand how Twitter worked. And um, so I might have had a couple of reds. And, yeah, Frio lost. So that eight and zip, zip and eight, sorry. And, um, yeah, I just sort of put something on Twitter. I just said zero and eight. And I kind of, I think at the time I felt like maybe that, you know, they were getting a bit of a rough end of the stick on selection like I might I might have the year before. So I think it was probably a lot of my own emotion coming out rather than actually that. But, um, yeah, I put something out and I said, at least my job's safe. I didn't know Rossi just signed a five-year deal either. Um <laughs> And I was starting to go all right with work. So I said, at least my job's safe or something. I don't know. You've probably got the tweet there. But, um, yeah, I didn't think much of it. And I had a few Muppets right back, something like, oh, you're a good footballer, fucking has been, rah, rah, rah. So, I don't know. After another red, I sort of started the team back. I said, how many games have you played? <laughs> and I was stuck, <laughs> like one of those dickheads. So, yeah. And then I didn't realise everyone could see all your conversation. And I had a few blokes text me, wow, like having to go on Twitter. Not, I don't even set my Twitter account up. I don't know how I got so many followers back then. I, I forgot the logins now. So <laughs> I've started a new one. I got one follower. Um, but uh, yeah, it got back to Rossi in Perth. And I was real nervous because obviously I was still a bit fearful of Rossi at the time. And Dorse goes, oh, the Perth, it's hit, it's hit the papers over here as well. So I reached out to Rossi and I apologised and I just said, oh, fake news again, you know. <laughs> um, nah, I just told him that, yeah, I didn't understand how Twitter worked and we'll catch up for a beer at the end of the year. So we had a, we had a beer at the end of the year and, um, yeah, it's all good. I get on real well with Rossi now. It's no bad blood. He's good. Yeah. Love it. No, it's a, that's, a, that's a ripping story. I love that one. So I'm sure all the listeners will love that. Um, but yeah, mate, that, that, is, that is all we've got time for today. That was, um, mm-hmm. that was a really, really great chat. We um, really appreciate you coming on. It's, it's been good. It's, uh, we've, we've learned a lot. There's been a lot of great stories and I'm um, sure the listeners are going to love that. So really appreciate you coming on, mate. And uh, really, yeah, really do appreciate your time. Pressure point! Pressure point! Pressure point!